Uh, well, it's so nice to see you all this morning. Thank you also for joining us here in the social room. This is, we expect, our last week that we'll be meeting here, and starting next week, we think we'll be all set up um, to go back over to the Cancer Center Auditorium. Uh, and, uh, and I'll give a plug next week. We're going to have a speaker doing a Thieves Market, which you may have, some of you may have seen at BCP Oregon. Uh, so come for that. It'll be a fun time. And I want to introduce our speaker today. Just before, though, our, uh, our speaker is uh, joining us today as part of the John Benson and John Kendall Jr. Memorial Lectures. So I wanted to give a brief introduction to those clinicians uh, before I introduce our speaker for today. Uh, so Dr. Benson, he uh, graduated Har Harvard Medical School in 1946 and moved to Portland in 1959, where he was the head of gastroenterology at the School of Medicine and was, uh, served as president of the American Board of Internal Medicine from 75 to 91, and was interim dean of the School of Medicine at OHSU from 91 to 93. Uh, and uh, even in his current emeritus status, I understand he's in his upper 90s, he's still active in the Foundation for Medical Excellence and Interprofessional Education. Only fairly recently uh, uh, stepped down from a professorship at the University of Nebraska. Uh, and Dr. Kendall uh, was uh, graduated from the University of Washington in 1956, and he came to Portland in 1950 as a fellow in endocrinology. He was at the VA Medical Center for years, and in fact is, uh, I understand it, responsible for the bridge that links OHSU Medical School to the VA Medical Center. With a little help from Mark Hatfield. With some help from Mark Hatfield. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so I don't think either of them are here today. I understand there was some some issues with uh, their housing, and I think they were out of town this morning, so we're sorry they couldn't join us. But the Benson and Kendall Visiting Professor Lectureship has uh, hosted a wide variety of excellent clinical educators and uh, exceptional speakers, and today is no exception. I wanted to introduce Dr. Rick Nishimura, who is our visiting uh, lecturer today. Dr. Nishimura is the Judd and Mary Norris Layton Professor of Cardiovascular Diseases and Professor of Medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. He currently has an active clinical practice in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine with a particular interest in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, valvular heart disease, and pericardial disease. Dr. Nishimura's clinical research areas have involved the field of cardiovascular hemodynamics. He is the director of the Knowledge Management Program at the Mayo Foundation. Uh, he's a Master of the American College of Cardiology, Master of the American College of Physicians, currently serves as Chair of the ACC AHA Valvular Heart Disease Guideline Committee, and is Chair of the ACC Master Teacher Award, the American Heart Association Linnaic Clinic Clinician Educator Award, as well as the Mayo Clinic Distinguished Educator Award, and Mayo Clinic Distinguished Clinician Award. Ah, oh, it's a mouthful, and he's done so much. We're so pleased he's here to join us today to talk about pericardial disease. Welcome to you, Dr. Nishimura. Got it. Well, thanks very much. It's, it's quite an honor to, um, uh, to be at this uh, visiting professorship and have enjoyed going from place to place to place and finally ending up here. So you, you wonder why in the field of cardiovascular diseases, when we have so much neat new stuff going on, like we're, we're putting in valves percutaneously now, we're ligating atrial appendage, uh, atrial fibrillation is practically going away from all of these ablations that people are doing, would I pick such a mundane topic such as pericardial disease? Because if you think of it, it's actually quite simple. Um, there's only three things that can go wrong with the pericardium. It can be inflamed, you can get fluid around it, or you can constrict. And then once you find it, there's only three things you do. You either reduce the inflammation, you remove the fluid, or you remove the pericardium. So, so something simple like this, you think would be a no-brainer for all of us clinicians. But it turns out that pericardial disease, and we know this not only from the data from the American Boards of Internal Medicine. Now, how many, how many people here are, are your residents? Ra raise your hand if you're a resident. Okay, so you're always at the back, aren't you? <laughs> so so, so um, 
I want you to know that on the internal medicine boards, um, they understand that the gap in knowledge for residents um, in cardiovascular disease is actually in pericardial disease. So by listening to this, I will give you about three or four correct answers on your boards that you'll thank me for in the future. But it really is, it's one of the misdiagnosed and undertreated diseases that we have because people actually think it's so simple. So what I wanna do is this, is whenever you give a talk, you're supposed to tell them what you're gonna tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them, so what I'm gonna tell you is this, we're gonna talk about some updates in treatment on inflammatory pericarditis. We're gonna talk about when to worry about a pericardial effusion. Now, back in the old days, we, it was really hard sometimes to know if a person had a pericardial effusion, but now you have echoes, so you've got your diagnosis right away, but what you have to know is when you call these catheter guys to come in and stick a needle in. And then finally, there's this diagnostic challenge of constrictive pericarditis that many times is missed. And it really is a treatable cause of heart failure. So um, I don't wanna get into pathophysiology, but instead knowing that we're all clinicians to give you a simple but practical approach to care for your patient. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go kind of back we're talking about new faces to an old disease. Um, the pericardium was actually first described by Hippocrates, and he described it as a smooth mantle surrounding the heart, containing a little bit of fluid resembling urine. And it was interesting that in his writing, he never described any disease of the pericardium because of their belief that the heart was too noble an organ to undergo a disease process. Now, we know that's different now in 2019, but I thought it was very interesting to read about that. And then Galen um, was the first to use the term pericardium, so it actually came from the Greek word that I cannot pronounce, but it does consist of more than just one layer. And you need to know this in order to understand how to treat these patients and what you need to do. So if we look at the pericardium, it actually consists of a number of different layers. The outside, uh, do we have any surgeons here? I just, no, so, so I can say whatever I want about the surgeons. So, so the outside layer is what the surgeons love taking off, okay? And, and that's the fibrous pericardium because it's easy to peel. But there's also this um, serous pericardium that has a couple layers. One is the parietal layer on the outside. One is the visceral layer on the inside. And the fluid actually comes between the parietal and visceral layer. And one of the mistakes that's made is when the surgeons go in for a pericardiectomy and they remove only the fibrous pericardium, they leave some of these other layers there which can continue to cause the problems. So, so that's why from the anatomic standpoint you have to understand these different layers of the pericardium. Now, let's go through some cases because I think it's, it's, it's easiest to kind of get a handle on what we're going to talk about if, if we go through the cases. And all of these are patients who came to uh, our clinic in the last year or so. But it's a 24-year-old man two days of severe pleuritic chest pain preceded by a URI. So pretty common, pretty easy. Since the talk is on pericardial disease, I think you've already made the diagnosis. But what you do is you go ahead and examine him. And, and I, I think in pericardial disease as well as valvular disease, the physical examination is of utmost importance. And I, I, I know that our own fellows and our residents tend to just try to get an echo report and make their decision on an echo report, but the people who've trained with me know that um, you're gonna miss the diagnosis a number of times. So you go ahead and you examine him, you particularly look at his neck veins, you listen to him, and he's got this which you can immediately identify as a pericardial rub. Now then you get his electrocardiogram, now I'll have you take a second to look at his electrocardiogram. And just a quick question for you. What do you call two orthopods reading an ECG? 
Anybody? Confused. Confused and a double blind study. <laughs> so we'll, 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 go, we'll, we'll go back to this, but we'll go back to the electrocardiogram in just a minute. Now, this person, the young guy comes to your office or comes to the emergency department, you say, what am I gonna do? And um, if we pick a cardiologist, 92% of them are going to get an echocardiogram. So what they do is they get the echocardiogram and charge the patient $1,500 and the echocardiogram comes back and says, well, it's normal. And then they realize that they've spent $1,500 on nothing because you really don't need an echocardiogram in this classic case of pericarditis. The next question then is you've got your diagnosis. You don't need an echocardiogram to diagnose acute pericarditis and a normal echocardiogram does not rule out pericarditis because you're not necessarily gonna see the inflammation. So I think that's the first point. Classic presentation, especially in young people, you don't really need anything more it's an inflammation of the pericardium. Nearly always it's gonna be due to a viral etiology. And the diagnosis is your cheap electrocardiogram and your physical examination. And if you wanna get a SED rate or a CRP, that'll clinch it to show you that inflammation is there. But if they have systemic symptoms, you already know that's gonna be elevated. The one test that's arisen in the past 10 years that I think is very valuable for you to know is to draw a troponin. And the reason for the troponin is it tells you that either number one, there is probably some myocardial injury from ischemia going on that you don't wanna miss, or there's a myocarditis associated with a pericarditis. And in both of those situations, you should probably admit the patient because they're at increased risk for further events, including ventricular arrhythmias. So the one test I would urge you to get is a troponin, and if it's elevated, get the person into the hospital. Now, let's go back over this electrocardiogram, especially for the residents there, because you have to be able to recognize this. This will be one of the questions that'll be on your boards for sure. But if you take a look at this electrocardiogram, what you see is you see these ST elevations, and you're starting to think, oh, there's a ST elevation myocardial infarction, but it's in the anterior leads, it's in the anterolateral leads, it's in the high lateral leads, it's in the inferior leads, and if in fact they had a STEMI, the patient would be dead because all of the leads, all of the myocardium would be involved. The second thing to look at is the contour. So these ST segments here, if you look at this contour, it's curving upward. And, and you just remember, it's like a smile. You know, remember a, a, a STEMI is gonna be like a frown, it's gonna be this coving like this. This is kind of smiling upwards. It's like a smile for pericarditis. And then finally, one of the, the, the very subtle things you look at is the PR interval gets involved in a pericarditis because the, the, the inflammation involves the atria. And if you look up there in AVR, you actually see a PR elevation. If you see a PR elevation, diffuse ST segment elevations, and they're going upward like a smile, you know you've got your diagnosis of pericarditis. It, it, it seems easy, but it's missed a lot of times. We know that from our own data. So you've made your diagnosis of pericarditis. You don't need an echocardiogram. You need a good electrocardiogram and a good set of eyes and mind to interpret the electrocardiogram. And you have to examine the patient. You've got your diagnosis. The next thing is how would you treat the patient? And this is a number of different medications that people have used. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people will give a little short burst of steroids, but I wanna show you what we need to do. Now the real treatment, and this has been shown in studies, is anti-inflammatory drugs. And actually, the best treatment is this old-fashioned aspirin. I don't know if many of you remember, but um, back in the old days when I was training, we didn't have levels, so I was told, well, you just go ahead and give enough aspirin until the ears start ringing. And then once the ears start ringing, just back down a little bit, and when they stop ringing, you're at a therapeutic level. I don't know if you, rem you remember that. But um, if you do, this aspirin is actually the best 
anti-inflammatory agent to give for something like pericarditis. It's, it's actually much more effective than the NSAIDs. Um, doesn't affect the kidneys like the NSAIDs do. Doesn't cause fluid retention like the NSAIDs do. Is much cheaper. If they have some ulcers or something, they're not gonna tolerate it. But young people, you'll find out that aspirin is really, really a magic drug in that situation. So I prefer to give aspirin. Um, alternatively, you can give non-steroidals to attack the inflammation. Now, does anybody know what this meadow saffron is? So it's a toxic plant. You eat it, you die. And um, it comes from the ancient Georgian state Colchis. So Colchis, it's Colchising. So that's where Colchising came from. So it's been around for centuries as a treatment. Now, um, we never knew what Colchising did until the last couple decades, but it actually has a mechanism different from anti-inflammatory agents that inhibits the microtubule self-assembly in the leukocytes. So it actually changes the way the leukocytes migrate and the action of the leukocytes. So it's actually synergistic with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. And what the Italians have done is they've actually done some randomized trials. They've uh, done the CORE trial, the COPE trial, the CORE trial, the ICAP trial, the CORP2 trial, a bunch of trials with different subsets of patients. But the bottom line is that if you look at all their trials, what they do is they randomize patients to aspirin alone versus aspirin plus colchicine. And if you have colchicine in addition to aspirin, you have a faster resolution of the symptoms of pericarditis and you prevent the recurrence. So the state now is to use your anti-inflammatory agents, preferably aspirin, and always add colchicine, and you get about 0.6 milligrams twice a day. And that really, really helps these patients. Now this is the problem, and this is a problem that we see, is that this patient was treated with steroids for a month, 40 milligrams, kind of fairly rapid taper as the prednisone comes off. But not uncommonly in a patient treated with steroids, what happens with this is he has a recurrence. And then you jack the steroids back up to the therapeutic level, and then you start to come down again. And what happens is that every time you start to come down on the steroids, you hit this level of about 10 to 15 milligrams, and boom, the inflammation comes back again. It's called chronic relapsing pericarditis, and it's devastating. It makes these young, healthy people actually in the cardiac invalids. They, they, it, it really dramatically changes their life. So we'll talk more about chronic relapsing pericarditis in just a minute. But overall, for acute idiopathic pericarditis, remember you don't need an echo. Um, you need to listen to the patient. Uh, you need to look at the electrocardiogram. You need to treat then with non or aspirin for at least a month, then taper off slowly. You can look at the inflammatory markers to do that. We usually add colchicine for about six months and then stop it. But remember, do not use steroids for risk of relapsing pericarditis. Now, if in fact you have pericarditis associated with a known rheumatologic disease, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, they're gonna get a pericarditis. And of course, you're gonna treat the underlying disease, and if that's either steroids or steroid-sparing agents, you use whatever you need to treat the underlying disease to treat the secondary pericarditis there. But in patients who have idiopathic pericarditis, you want to stay away from the steroids if at all possible because of this concept that you develop severe relapsing pericarditis. And again, it's very clear. I've had about five young people come in the past month from all over the country um, who have this. Has anybody seen this in a patient? Raise your hand if you've seen one. Yeah, so you know how devastating it is. And, they, they, just can't, they, they just can't go about their business. And even a little bit of activity um, will set things off. So what do you do with this? Well, the, the medical treatment 
is this very, very high dose aspirin with colchicine and an incredibly slow taper of prednisone. So you rapidly taper till you get to about 15 milligrams. And then you go down as slowly as one milligram per month. It means that it takes a lot of patience on your part and the patient's part, and it can take up to a year and a half to two years, but that seems the only way to get these patients off the medication, and probably effective about 50% of the time. So we're looking for other things to do. Now, rheumatology has a lot of newer therapies, such as the interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, Anakinra. And when we and others have tried that, it is very effective in decreasing relapses of pericarditis. But I think what happens is you kind of turn um, this disease into a chronic disease because they usually can't get off the anakinra. Now, a lot of patients would rather take a shot once a week and never have pericarditis, and they'll accept the anakinra, but it's not a magic cure. It'll help the symptoms, but you'll probably need to be on it the rest of your life, and that's something to remember. The other thing to think about is this. Uh, it, it seems um, uh, quite invasive, but our um, surgeons have actually performed complete pericardiectomies on these patients. And you say, oh my gosh, open heart surgery for pericarditis. But um, the patients who've had the open heart surgery have been very, very grateful several months later when the pericarditis is no longer there. So just something to think about, an unusual treatment for just plain old pericarditis, but in these very devastating cases of the chronic relapsing pericarditis is very, very effective, okay? I wanna go back to this electrocardiogram. The first one was that 24-year-old young man who had these typical symptoms of pericarditis. Here's another patient, older patient, Again, typical symptoms of pericarditis, but his is, here's his electrocardiogram. And again, you start to look, you see these ST segment elevations, you hear a rub, you think, oh my gosh, you know, this is simple, he's got pericarditis. But then look very close at the contour of the ST segment elevation. And it's not that smile, it's more kind of that frown, that coving. So what happened with this patient he actually had a lateral infarction. He had occluded a small obtuse marginal artery, had that transmural infarction, and had a secondary pericarditis. And you're only gonna be able to pick that up, number one, if you get your troponins, which is necessary, but number two, really, really study that electrocardiogram because the subtleness of the upcoving, the smile versus the frown is gonna tell you what the answer is. And that patient, is gonna be treated much, much differently than just acute pericarditis. So beware of pericarditis in the setting of infarction, and in these small infarcts that are transmural enough to cause a pericarditis, they're actually at increased risk for rupture, something to remember. So that's pericarditis, kind of simple, but um, there's been a lot of mistakes made in the diagnosis and treatment of these, you know, over-testing, all of the things we want to be able to avoid so that's the take home message on acute pericarditis. Now next let's go to pericardial effusion. Now here is pericardial effusion and that little squishy thing that's kind of contracting and relaxing, that's the heart. And the big black space around it is a huge pericardial effusion. So it is the fluid between the parietal and visceral layers of the serous pericardium. So that's why it's important for you to understand the anatomy of the pericardium because that is where the fluid is going to be. Now, the question is not whether or not pericardial effusion is present because you can, an echocardiogram and a high suspicion, you'll always be able to make your diagnosis. It's never gonna be equivocal. But you need to decide whether or not that effusion is benign and you can continue to watch or whether or not it's a medical emergency in becoming a tamponade. Now, in that comes your physical examination. So again, I'm gonna go back to an old disease and talk about this concept of pulsus paradoxus, which was actually first described by Kussmaul uh, in the late 1800s. 
And he actually had a young 34-year-old woman who was severely dysmic and cachexic. And he, she came, and he had this unusual phenomenon where he was palpating the chest and felt this very, very forceful cardiac contraction. Yet when he palpated the radial pulse, he found that the radial pulse would disappear and then realized it was disappearing only with inspiration. So he termed this concept pulses paradoxus because there was a discrepancy between the cardiac action that he felt and the radial pulse which disappeared with inspiration. Now that pulses paradoxus is an essential physical examination component to know whether or not you're gonna go in and drain that fluid or whether the fluid is not causing a problem. In this benign observe, therefore, you have to examine the patient, you have to use some echocardiographic clues to be able to determine where they are. Now here's the cardiac catheterization. Um, their aortic pressure is there, 50 over 30. Uh, there's no doubt that this is pericardial tamponade. Hypotension, the arrows point to inspiration when the pressure markedly drops. The right atrial pressure is significantly elevated, lost the wide descent. Those patients need an emergency pericardial synthesis, no doubt about it. It's either happens in the lab sometimes when um, we rupture things. It happens if a person who has had a malignancy comes back with a rapid effusion. That's an emergency. You need somebody to come and tap it right away. There might be other instances that are more subtle. So for instance, this patient here is not hypotensive, um, has a little bit of a drop of the pressure with inspiration, and you can, you can actually feel that when, you, when, when they take a deep breath in, it drops slightly. But those patients kind of have a tachycardia. So if they're developing the subclinical tamponade, they have a tachycardia, and this is where your clinical acumen comes into play. You know, you, you, you've been around long enough that you know you can walk into a person's room or, or see them in your office and they just don't look right. There's something about them that's telling you um, there's something going on. And you should use that gut reaction in a patient with a pericardial effusion to just go ahead and get it drained. Um, the TTE is the gold standard for the diagnosis of pericardial effusion. The cardiologists in the room realize that there's other echo parameters that you use, RV collapse, RA collapse, the IVC will be dilated, there'll be some Doppler parameters we'll talk about in just a few minutes that'll make your diagnose. But the thing that we all have to understand is that the presence or absence of hemodynamic compromise, which is a pericardial tamponade, is not necessarily the volume of the fluid, but the rate of accumulation. So up in your upper left-hand side there is a person who's got a small effusion, but that person's going downhill with pericardial tamponade after one of our electro fiddlers perforated into the right ventricle. The person on the bottom right has a larger effusion, but that's been there for five years and very stable and nothing you really need to do. So how do you tell the difference between them? It's your physical examination and that gut reaction. Now, I would urge the, the cardiologist, and, and Charles, are you guys doing echo-directed pericardial synthesis here? Yeah, good, so you brought it with you. <laughs> okay. Um, in the past, we just used to do blind sticks um, in the cath lab, but you really want this echo-directed pericardial synthesis, and I would ask for it from your cardiologist because they can actually use the echo probe and see where the fluid is and instead of going subcostal like we always used to do, most of the time you kind of go from an apical approach. But with that, you can very safely do a pericardial synthesis, even on the small effusions. And I think that's something for all of you to understand is that even with the small effusion, you've got some experienced cardiologists, they can go ahead and drain the effusion. Um, they'll go ahead and also put some agitated saline in to make sure that their needles in the pericardium and not the right ventricle, but we've got ways of being safe with that. So when to intervene, hemodynamic compromise, and that's just kind of this gut reaction, see a little tachycardia, neck veins are going to be elevated, 
and you're going to have a pulses. But there are other instances when you want to tap. Number one is they come in with systemic symptoms, may have an infection. You should tap it to make sure there's not a purulent pericarditis. Number two, if there's malignancy, they had a breast cancer removed about five years ago or a lung cancer, you want to tap it to make sure there's not a malignancy. And finally, if they have a recurrent effusion, you want to tap it to be able to find out why. So we've covered pericarditis. We've covered pericardial effusion. Let's now go to what I consider the most difficult diagnostic challenge that we have. Because your patient could be a 72-year-old man who comes in and is cachectic, and you think the guy's got cancer, and he's been through a full cancer workup, but nothing was found in terms of the cancer. It could be the 66-year-old woman, and this is more frequent now, who've had open heart surgery and just failure to get back to things after open heart surgery. It could be this 52-year-old runner. Now, I know you've got a lot of runners here, and um, the last guy that came to me was a marathon runner um, who was used to running about seven and a half, eight-minute miles for the marathon and um, found that he hit his wall at about 16 miles and 22 miles, and his miles went up to nine minutes. Now, to me, if I could run a nine-minute mile, that would be fantastic. <laughs> but um, for these people who are well-trained, just some change there is enough to put you on to the fact that something might be going on. And this person could have constrictive pericarditis. And then finally, um, uh, uh, one of my favorites is we, we've got some really good liver people at Mayo. And I've got a guy who's calling me about once a month and saying, uh, Nish, this guy came to me with cirrhosis. His liver is enlarged. He's got this ascites. But um, he actually looked at the patient and found the neck veins were elevated and sent the patient to us. And we cured his cirrhosis by removing the constrictive pericarditis. So the, 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 the point of all of these is to tell you that um, constrictive pericarditis is a great masquerader. It, it can come in all different types of flavors, and you have to be aware of all the different presentations that these people have. Now, basically, constrictive pericarditis is right heart failure out of proportion to left-sided disease, but it's incredibly important to make this diagnosis, especially the residents have to remember this because it is the only treatable cause of heart failure that we have. Everything else is just kind of, we, we, we make them feel better, but we don't actually treat the underlying cause. Constrictive pericarditis, if you make the diagnosis, you can actually cure their heart failure. Now, the first known clinical description was actually back in the 1600s. Um, and uh, Richard Lauer, uh, Sir Richard Lauer, actually described this young 30-year-old woman who had a small and often intermittent pulse. Uh, in the early 1900s then, people like Paul Dudley White described the whole syndrome of constrictive pericarditis. And it was shown over and over and over again in their case studies that this is a diagnosis that is very commonly missed. The treatable etiology means that you can cure it with a radical pericardiectomy. This is kind of a new concept because a lot of surgeons will go in and just do a window. Don't ever let them do a window. Windows don't do anything. Then better surgeons will go in and do a complete pericardiectomy where they remove the pericardium phrenic nerve to phrenic nerve. But what we found out that it is the radical pericardiectomy where you not only remove the front of the pericardium, but you go underneath and you remove the inferior diaphragmatic and posterior surface of the pericardium that allows you to get the best result. So I would highly urge you to talk to your surgeons about doing these radical pericardiectomies because we always have a number of patients who come to us after a, quote, complete pericardiectomy is done with residual constrictive pericarditis who then get better from the radical pericardiectomy. Now, like a lot of things in heart disease, early diagnosis and treatment is critical. 
If you let constrictive pericarditis go, what happens are two things. Number one is that calcification of the pericardium goes into the myocardium and it causes myocardial damage. But more importantly, what happens is you get liver dysfunction, cirrhosis, and you get renal dysfunction. So if you wait for the patient to develop liver dysfunction and renal dysfunction, their operative risk is going to go way up. Whereas if you can get to them early, where their creatinine's still normal, where their transaminases haven't gone up much, their operative risk is actually quite low. The other thing is the long-term survival is dictated by how sick they are when they come to you. So this is kind of telling us, hey, we, we, we should try to get these patients earlier rather than later, if at all possible. Um, at Mayo Clinic, we've got 12 surgeons. Um, as Charles knows, um, I've got a couple favorites, and for pericardial disease, I only use two of the surgeons because we really need the experienced surgeon to do this. Any surgeon can do a bypass, any surgeon can put in a valve, but for some of these diseases like constrictive pericarditis, you need your best, most highly experienced surgeon to be able to get the good results. Now, the question to you all, is can you make the diagnosis? And in the past, if you read textbooks on constrictive pericarditis, you, you know, the, the, the old thought is, well, it's this masquerader of mitral stenosis, dilated cardiomyopathy, pulmonary hypertension, but that doesn't matter anymore because an echo can easily rule out these other masqueraders that were written about in the 1960s and early 1970s. What we have now is this type of patient here. And we're the internal medicine residents. Take a look at that upper right-hand panel. Okay. That's the neck vein. That's the neck vein that's elevated. That's the neck vein that's elevated with rapid Y descent. Don't ever forget that because you can walk into a patient's room, you can look at them, and you can make your diagnosis. Okay, neck veins are up here, but instead of staying up here like they do in heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, they're up here and they drop, they drop, they drop. See that? See how it's dropping? That is a diagnostic pearl for constrictive pericarditis. This is what our liver people look at whenever a person comes in with cirrhosis because if they see that, this is constrictive pericarditis causing the liver disease. This is the way that you're going to make the diagnosis. And I really want to emphasize that because um, in, in 2019, very little emphasis is being put on the physical examination, which you guys really, really need to do uh, to be able to make this type of a diagnosis. Now, it's right heart failure, elevated venous pressure, rapid X and Y descent. Look at the neck veins if no other cause. Get them to one of the cardiologists to say, diagnose constrictive pericarditis. Cardiologists, on the other hand, so, so the internists and, and the residents, you know when to push them. For the cardi how many cardiologists are here? Raise your hand. Oh, so we've got quite a few. You know that this is a very, very difficult diagnosis to make. The reason it's more difficult to make in 2019 is that we have this type of a patient here. So here's a 44-year-old woman, prior radiation disease, um, prior Hodgkin's disease had mantle radiation, might have had breast cancer mantle radiation, did well in terms of the malignancy, cured from the malignancy, but 10 years later starts to come back with heart disease. And, and the problem with radiation heart disease is it involves everything, the coronaries, the aorta, the valves, the myocardium, and the pericardium, and it's hard to differentiate them. If they have either myocardial or pericardial involvement, they'll have this type of examination here. And they'll have this type of echo, which shows that the left ventricle is contracting normally. And we'll talk about some of the mitral flow velocity curves in just a minute. But basically what you do is you say this person's got a normal left ventricle, has no valve disease, has no pulmonary hypertension, has a high right-sided pressure, it's got to be either constrictive pericarditis or myocardial disease. 
Now, what we did in the past was we went through a number of these tests. But the first test is to look at the pericardium itself. In these patients here, getting an imaging test really doesn't help you very much because almost everybody who has had radiation therapy and the other cause is patients after open heart surgery is gonna have some patchy pericardial thickening. And 20% with proven constrictive pericarditis will have a normal pericardium on the CT scan. So it really doesn't help you that much to scan to do the expensive CT or MR scans. In the past, we used to send them to a cardiac cath lab to, to look at things like this early rapid filling. And actually, this will be on for internal medicine residents too. You look at your LV and RV pressure and you see this, what's called a square root sign and N equalization of pressures. But the problem is, is that that can be seen in either myocardial disease or pericardial disease. And these were the conventional criteria that we used to use in the past, but when we kind of looked at our own data for patients with constrictive pericarditis versus restrictive cardiomyopathy, um, you really couldn't use those old data to differentiate one from the other. So, now it's difficult for the cardiologist. For the internists and residents, you know what you need to do. Neck veins up, rapid descents, no other cause, send them. Cardiologists, now you have to differentiate between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy, either after radiation or open heart surgery. And that's very, very difficult. Echo diagnosis, referral, heart failure, normal LV function, normal valves. One of the things for the cardiologist that will help you is to look at the septum. We don't emphasize that enough, but if you take a look at the septum right here, you see instead of coming and closing, coming and closing, it bounces. You see that bounce there? That bounce is what happens when you have early rapid filling, in other words, blood's coming into the ventricle, it expands, then just stops right there. And on your M mode, for those of you who have looked at M mode, you see this kind of little bounce there. And that's reflected in this bounce you see on your two-dimensional echocardiogram. So if you see the septal shift, you see the septal shutter, you know that the venous pressure is elevated, you get your hemodynamic information. Now, this gets into more pathophysiology. And I, and I know um, there's people who might just kind of space out with this, but actually if you bear with me and let me explain to you what we as cardiologists are looking at, you'll find it's kind of neat. Because what we want to do is we want to differentiate between whether or not the patient has a pericardium that's causing the restriction to filling or a stiff heart muscle. If you have pericardium and you send them to surgery, they're gonna get better. If you have a stiff heart muscle, you send them to surgery, they're gonna die. So, so it's very, very important. And before we were just looking at kind of one beat, what happens to the pressures in one beat, what we subsequently learn is the way to tell the difference between these two entities is to look throughout respiration. And so we'll have two concepts. Dissociation between intrathoracic and cardiac pressures, increased ventricular interaction is quite a mouthful, but let me explain what that means. And then you'll think it's kind of neat. Um, if we have a normal pericardium, which can be in a normal person or a person with muscle disease, if the patient takes a breath in, the intrathoracic pressure drops, but that's reflected inside the heart, so the pressure in the heart drops also. So the driving pressure from the lungs to the heart stays the same during inspiration and expiration, okay? Now, if I've got this rigid pericardium around the heart and I take a breath in, the intrathoracic pressure drops, but the pressure in the ventricle is shielded from that, and that doesn't drop. So the driving pressure from the lungs to the heart actually goes down, it decreases. If we go ahead and we look at and this is a catheterization in which we've got a catheter in the left ventricle and a catheter in the wedge position. If you look at this driving pressure here across the mitral valve from the wedge to the left ventricle, it's the same during inspiration and expiration in a normal pericardium. Now, if we look at a patient with constrictive pericarditis, take a look at this. 
This driving pressure here markedly reduces during inspiration and markedly increases during expiration. That's called dissociation of intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures. And just for the residents to know, when you get your echo reports back, um, the cardiologist is going to talk about these E velocities on your mitral. So if you have a Doppler across your mitral valve, you're actually measuring flow across the mitral valve. And the E velocity is that initial flow. Now if you think about it, with constrictive pericarditis, if that flow goes down during inspiration, the E velocity is going to go down during inspiration. And that's one of the Doppler criteria for differentiating between constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy. So if, in fact, you've got a patient who has the classic presentation, comes in, right heart failure, you look at the neck veins, they're up, they've got these rapid descents, they might have a little bit of ascites and, and things, but their LV function's normal. They don't have any valve disease. They don't have any severe pulmonary hypertension. And you see the septal bounce, and you see those mitral inflows, they can be sent right to surgery. Got to be a good surgeon, but they can be sent right to surgery, and you know that they will get better. And that happens about 70 to 75% of the time. Um, but I think it's important because you don't need anything else to help you out there. Now, there will be about uh, 25 to 30% of patients in whom there'll be kind of equivocal things going on, especially after radiation. I, and I'm sure you've seen some of these radiation patients. And just for the cardiologist, we talk about n expiratory reversals in the hepatic veins and high DTIs of the mitral annulus. It's helpful, but will not make your diagnosis. No matter how many papers were published there, I'm not going to use that to send the patient to surgery. We're going to look at the hemodynamics being dynamic. We talked about that dissociation, but the other thing is there's enhanced ventricular interaction, which means that if you've got this rigid pericardium around the heart, as blood decreases into the left ventricle during inspiration, it's got to increase in the right ventricle. So now what we do is you, you call up Charles Ken and you say, take him to the cath lab. Um, you're going to need to see at least one of these elevation and end equalization of pressures in the low cardiac output. And you'll see those typical flows there. But what you then want to do is you want to look at the left ventricle and right ventricle during the respiratory cycle. One of these is classic constriction. The other is severe muscle disease. And if we look at the area underneath the left ventricle and right ventricle with inspiration versus expiration, we see that this patient here has decreased area in the left ventricle, increased area in the right ventricle. That's that pericardium causing that enhancement of ventricular interaction, and that's constrictive pericarditis. If you have bad muscle disease, everything's going to fall during the inspiration or not change during inspiration, and that's a normal pericardium. And this new catheterization criteria that we've developed is actually very, very helpful in determining who's going to go for operation. So we're looking at this enhanced ventricular reaction, and it's quite good, but you need some good hemodynamic cath people to help you out here that I know you have. So constrictive pericarditis for the cardiologist, what you can count on, dilated IVC, septal shift is diagnostic. The Doppler stuff is helpful, but not diagnostic. You have to always see end equalization and elevation of pressures, but it's going to be that LVRV discordant that's going to be diagnostic for you in your thing. Now I'm showing this again. We've concentrated on this again because I think many of you are primary care, internal medicine, hospitalist residents, you have to be able to recognize this. And it is, in my mind, the most unrecognized disease in cardiology today. I always go and give cardiology grand rounds at um, some of these academic centers, and when I talk to the fellows, I say, how many of you have diagnosed constrictive pericarditis? And very few, if any, have. Over the next year, I'll usually get about three or four emails 
from these excited young cardiology trainees to say, hey, guess what? I've diagnosed constrictive pericarditis, and I truly think it's because they didn't know how to look for it. So if you see this patient in your office with this elevated venous pressure, really, really think about constrictive pericarditis. Um, we'll go over that, but I want to end up by saying that we started out by saying it was simple, but showing that it is misdiagnosed <coughs> under treatment. And I think what we have to remember is that pericardial disease, although uncommon, does occur, and it will occur in your practice and it'll show up time and time again. And there's certain things you have to remember, like not to give steroids for acute pericarditis, to use colchicine for pericarditis, to have that pericardial fusion tap for these certain indications, and be aware when you're thinking constrictive pericarditis. You need the clinical acumen. An echo report is, or an MR report or a CT report is not necessarily going to make your diagnosis. Your examination is, and your high index of suspicion is. And it's so rewarding if you actually make the diagnosis because you send these patients with constrictive pericarditis to operation, and they will live a completely normal life thereafter and really thank you for your clinical acumen. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Is that, do you think that's true or, uh, and versus an infarction where the T-wave inversion is while the ST segment is... Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely correct. There's some repolarization changes that occur late um, that are different from uh, ST elevation infarction, and, and you can go ahead and use those. Second question, um, what, what purpose does the pericardium serve? Uh, it doesn't. So uh, patients ask that all the time is, what, what does the pericardium do? And it used to think it prevents infection and it keeps the heart from shifting, but you do complete pericardiectomies and nothing, nothing happens. So I, I, I don't know. I think it's like your appendix. I don't know why we have it, but we have it. <laughs> Charles. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so Yeah, so Charles has a good point is some patients present with, you know, high neck veins, hemodynamic compromise, they have a pericardial effusion. And you go ahead and tap the effusion, you think oh everything's all taken care of. But you always have to see them a month later because some of them might have what we call effusive constrictive pericarditis where you remove the fluid but they end up having constriction. Now those are the patients I would treat with high dose anti-inflammatory agents to see if there's an inflammatory component there. But if they don't respond, then you have to take the pericardium off. So, so you should all, never think you're done, this is a very good point, never think you're done if you drain an effusion because you always have to see them in follow up. Yeah. Do you think there's a role for BNP in distinguishing between restriction and constriction? It's a, it's a fascinating question, but I, I think that BNP messes you up. And the reason it messes you up is BNP um, is uh, based upon uh, kind of the strain and the stress in the ventricle. And in both restriction and constriction, you don't have that stress because the ventricle is not dilated. So BNP levels are actually falsely low in both of these uh, diseases. Um, so it, I'd like to say it would help you, but it'd probably mess you up more than anything else. In, in fact, that's one of the reasons that people say, well, this can't be heart failure because the BNP is low when it really is. Yes? Um, two questions, first of all. And this is a great talk, by the way. Um, use of Toradol, like 60 milligrams I am, because when I do that in the office for acute pericarditis, it's very um, gratifying to see yeah. that. 
So yeah, I think Toradol is, is a nice drug to give. I mean, they're in excruciating pain, so whatever you can do to help them out. But I would still add the anti-inflammatory agents because you want to treat the underlying cause. But Toradol would be fine. Now we had a nice discussion last night about um, our advanced practice providers. Um, and you know, how many here are APPs? Anybody? Okay, so you're, you're very valuable to the medical profession. Um, and you're actually gonna be the future on how we take care of patients. But they're not gonna have the medical training of four years of medical school, three years of residency, so on and so forth. On the other hand, it's gonna be up to us to educate them to look for these unusual instances which treatment will make a significant difference. So at the national level, we've got uh, some educational, a lot of educational programs that we're putting on for the advanced practice providers. And, and I think just examination and recognition of neck veins and what it means is, is, is an essential part of our job to educate the team that we're gonna be using to take care of all these patients. Yes? Yeah, I, I, I don't actually know the actual incidence. I, 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 we just don't have the denominator. We don't have enough diagnoses made. But I can tell you um, at Mayo, and you, you know, we're biased because people come to us, but people still come to us. We've gone from doing about 20 pericardiectomies a year to 200 pericardiectomies a year. Um, and a lot of them, you're right, are due to this um, previous radiation therapy where, where they get cured from their cancer, but then they come back with heart disease. And so, so, so that's why, I, that's why I picked this topic because I think we're going to be seeing more and more of it, and we're going to need to know what to do with it. Is there any tips for the patient I struggle with a lot? Is the patient in atrial fibrillation? Yeah. And particularly if they've got associated bicuspid disease, can we give you any tips on? Yeah. So. What Charles is talking about, we're using this mitral inflow velocity to, to see if there's changes with respiration. But when you're in atrial fibrillation, your RR interval varies so much that you can have changes just from the variation in the RR interval. Um, what we've done there is we've taken to the cath lab and done VVI pacing to regularize that. But I really think that this septal shift I mean, the more and more I see, the more and more I think that septal shift is gonna give you a clue. And the other thing that you guys can look at is, I didn't show, but there's this distal fixation of the coronary arteries on coronary angiography that is quite pathic mnemonic of constrictive pericarditis. So we're actually writing a little manuscript on some of these other parameters that you can use in instances like atrial fibrillation. Yeah. Um, do they understand why that the, you know, why that is targeted or why they have such trouble? I have no idea, but I know that then if you tell the dialysis people take more off, the pericardial effusion goes away. So I I don't know why why it is associated. I mean, it, it has to do something with the interleukin one receptors and and things like that that are get activated in renal disease, but. Um, those are a very special group of people that um, we just don't know what to do with. Well, I think okay, thank you very much. Thank you.